so now if we actually want to measure the scale factor and the distance, we can go to step back to our idea of standard candles. And we can note the following, which we've already seen. If we have an object with known L and measured F, where this is luminosity and this is flux, then we can get a luminosity distance from the following. dl equals luminosity over square or 4 pi f or square rooted. And dl is the luminosity distance. And locally, that's just the distance. But in official lines, it's the distance an object would have in a Euclidean non-expanding universe. And just bear in mind what that means. So if I look at a, an expanding universe, and say I look at redshift 1, and I look at visual light, so that's a 400 to 800 nanometers. That's what I observe. But in the rest frame, I'm observing like from 200 to 400 nanometers. I divide by one plus Z to get that. So here I'm looking at 400 nanometers of light. And here I'm looking at 200 nanometers of light. Now, firstly, it's not obvious that a source has an equal brightness here and here. So the sun, for example, it's brightest at about 500 nanometers. On the other hand, you know, it's very faint at 200 nanometers. Not very faint, you still wouldn't want to look at it, but nonetheless, it's much fainter. So firstly, there's a spectral change to worry about, but even before you worry about that, just assume it's equally bright at all wavelengths. Here, I've measured it over 400 nanometers, and here I've measured it over 200 nanometers. So there's this effect called band stretching. So it appears fainter by this factor of one plus Z. But then it's also moving away at a significant fraction of C. And remember, moving clocks run slower. So there is time dilation, which is another factor of 1 plus Z. So DL is much bigger than DP, where DP is the proper distance, like it's the ruler distance, by a factor of 1 plus Z squared. So there's really quite a difference in the distances you're considering. And so well, you can easily get luminosity distances which look like the light travel time is longer than the age of the universe. But that's because you've got this 1 plus Z squared multiplication which sits in there. So that's just sort of subtlety of what you're doing. So... If we want to do cosmology, we want to do the scale factor, we need standard candles observable at large distances. And these are what we call type 1A supernova. And a type 1A supernova 
is an exploding white dwarf. White dwarfs are the remnants of stars like the sun. Or in fact, any star which has less than a mass of about eight times the mass of the sun. And you can think of them crudely as being mass of the sun, size of the earth. So they're very, very dense, right? You've taken all the mass of the sun and you've crushed it down into the size of the Earth. And they're held up by an effect called electron degeneracy pressure. And what that means is that electrons are fermions. They can't all be in the same quantum state. And if you haven't done that in quantum mechanics yet, don't worry too much about that. But the point being, when I push electrons together, they can't all end up in the same ground state because you can only have one electron per state. And white dwarfs also, if I increase the mass of a white dwarf, for example, by pouring mass onto it, it gets smaller, and so the pressure goes up. And there is a critical point called the Chandrasekhar mass. And I can't spell Chandrasekhar here. Let me try that again. Chandrasekhar mass, which is about 1.4 times the mass of the sun where this stops working and you get an explosion. And it's fairly standard because it always happens at about this mass. And you can do this either by taking mass from an another star like the sun or by merging two white dwarves. So you can accrete, i.e. pick up mass So for another normal star, we call it a main sequence star. Or from another white dwarf. And when you do that, you have a final route to your explosion. Uh, that explosion synthesizes large amounts of radioactive nickel. which decays to 56 cobalt, which decays to iron, which is the most stable element in the universe, basically. And you get a light curve, which is determined, in a sense, by the, the half-lives and the radioactive heating from these things. So if I have something here, this is my luminosity. And this is my time. You get a light curve, which goes up and comes down again. And what people can do to first order is they use this peak luminosity as a standard candle. It's not quite that simple because what actually happens is that there's a little bit of range of behavior in that there is a range of peak magnitudes in type 1a supernovae. So, just using the peak, the scatter you get is about 30%. But there is a correlation, which is sometimes called the Phillips relation, which says that fainter supernovae evolve faster. And when you use that, you get a scatter of about 5%. And that allows you to build a very accurate Hubble diagram. And so if I look at the Hubble diagram for type 1a supernovae, it looks something like this. This is actually an old figure, but nonetheless, it's quite an important figure. 
So this is from uh, a 1998 paper. I think this is from Saul Perlmutter's group. And this is the Hubble diagram for type 1a supernovae. And what you notice, and it's not entirely obvious because this is the data that first discovered it, is that what you really expect to have here is you expect that as you move out in redshift, you've got, if you've got a matter-dominated universe, then what you're going to have is you're actually going to have a decelerating universe, which will look something like this. Or you could have a universe that just obeys Hubble's law, which is the straight lines on here. And what you actually have is you have a bending away. So high redshift... SN one A are further away than expected by E. G. Hubble law and that means that the universe is accelerating. e.g. exponential t, cosmological constant. And so that, therefore, is a remarkable demonstration of the fact that there is dark energy. And, you know, in some ways, you know, this was all happening at the same time in the late 1990s. This was actually the first real claim of accelerating con universe and the presence of dark energy. It was done by two independent groups, uh, one led by Brian Schmidt and Adam Rees, uh, and the other led by Saul Perlmutter. All three of those won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2011. And so, you know, these are major, you know, important results that are coming forward.